Hi there, and welcome to the Way Most of Geekery for the week of May 27, 2019. I'm Dusty Red, and with me as always... Dusty Wait. And this week we have a special episode where we have an interview with Pat Rickard, who is also the DM of Loaded Dice Adventures. You can find his Twitch stream every Monday at 7.30 at Loaded Dice Adventures slash Twitch. Um, he's an old friend of mine, but he's also an old LARPer and a longtime dungeon master slash game master slash storyteller who has done a number of games from obviously D- Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition to Pathfinder to a variety of games. But primarily what I remember him from is Neuro Midwest back in the late 90s and early 2000s. So we had a nice chat and sat down and asked him some questions on his views and his experiences as a, we'll air quote, professional DM and what he's seen and what his views are and even as a more of a gray muzzle elder statesman's view of seeing Dungeons and Dragons go through its growing up stage of him playing in the 80s and such. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this episode and uh, we'll talk to you later. And today we have a very special guest, Pat who is a longtime DM and an old friend of mine from Nero and some other games. Hi, Pat. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Ah, Fantastic. We're actually really honored to have you here. And Ah, so... Honored to be on. Well, thank you. So let's start with your history. What (laughs) got you into gaming as a whole? Like, what was your start into gaming? Into gaming itself or into role-playing gaming? Um, we could, I mean, what, what was your first? What did you get into in terms of gaming? Uh, well, I mean, I guess the, the start of it all was, I, I owe that to my mom, was just she got me interested in all of the, you know, swords, knights, and, you know, King Arthur and all that. And I, I'd always had an interest in those, Robin Hood, King Arthur, read everything I could on it. And then about the time I was 11 years old, the... I grew up in, Cal- in Palm Springs, California, and they had a thing called Lyceum of the Desert, which was a, a program put together where they give like junior high school, high school age kids something to do in the off hours or you know during the summer. Keep and, you off them streets. <laughs> they, oh yeah, the streets of Palm, Palm Springs. Palm Springs, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they, but they they give you something to do in those off hours, and and one of them at the time was Dungeons and Dragons. I didn't know what it was. Uh, and you know, my my stepmother at the time said, "Hey, this sounds like something you might be interested in. You know, it's all about you know about all these things that you like, all the fantasy books and everything that you read." And it was like, "Well, oh, you know, yeah, all right, I'll give it a shot." And uh, it was run actually by one of the third grade teachers in the in the <laughs> district, so uh, completely sanctioned by the school system out there in Palm Springs. So. Which is uh, weird, seeing as really like weird. D&D had its issue with like satanic books and stuff. Yeah, and that was kind of right in the middle of that whole that whole scare. And I was about um, to ask if, if not to give away your age, but hey, we're gray yeah. muzzles here. What about what year was that? <laughs> um, that would have been eighty one or eighty two. So I mean, right during right, all of yeah, that. Yeah, I mean. Right during all that, when you know Tom Hanks was in Myths and Mazes, and uh-huh. you know all that stuff that went on, uh, I heard all of it. And to their credit, I mean, my my folks were awesome about it. My stepmom, and it was always, you know, we we go play. And it was my stepmom was a teacher. My best friend at that time, whose mom was a teacher, played. Uh, so we all played. We played together. Are you talking about this? Place? Yes, I am. That was my <laughs> done. Uh, so, uh, anyway, my, my stepmom, Are you <laughs> hang on a second. <laughs> yes, I am, buddy. You can be quiet, okay? <laughs> so, but my stepmom at the time, you know, I mean, she, she was awesome. Uh, and it was, it was always anytime we had a game and we'd come back from it and it'd be like, you know, oh, you know, how was your Satan worshiping? I was like, right. <laughs> so he was even uh, tongue in cheek. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely tongue nice. in cheek. And they, I mean, they had me. You know, they actually had me. The the first game I ever ran was for my dad, my stepmom, and two of her friends. So, you know, imagine that. You know, I'm a, I'm a at that point in time I was a 13 year old kid, and I'm I'm uh, DMing for my parents. So. That's actually really cool. And they have that kind really of support cool. too. Like yeah, you see I mean, that 
nowadays yeah. where people are just getting into that stuff thanks to the popularity of like Game of Thrones and even the Star Wars stuff kind of reborn, so to speak, and whatnot. Right. Yeah, it's really awesome to hear that your family supported that. Like, yeah, they, I'm sure I mean, she they... was lambasted by her PTA. <laughs> well, How she... dare you? Not so really, obviously though. then that, that kind of eliminates one of our other questions I was going to ask too is you obviously have a child. I assume you're going to in, indoctrinate them into. <laughs> He's already got his, uh, the, the one, two, threes and the ABCs of D and D. So oh, <laughs> that's nice. fantastic. I was just are... talking about that. I had an ABC book of comic books or comic heroes mm-hmm. yeah. that taught me they, ABCs. It, it, yeah, this one's actually written by, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember Ivan's last name now, but uh, he's uh, one of the one of the, the GMs for Geek and Sundry. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Ivan Van Norman. Ivan Van Norman. Awesome. Okay. Fantastic. Ivan Van Norman. And he, he wrote them with, I think, a friend of his. Uh, great books. I mean, they're really, really cool. Uh, and we've already got Brendan. He's already reading them. Okay, and, so and, to kind of hop on with the Geek and Sundry... Uh-huh. As a long-running player DM, player slash DM of tabletops, what is your opinion in regards to the popularity of things like Geek and Sundry and Critical Role? I think that it's awesome. Uh, I think that those two entities starting out at the same time, uh, essentially the same time that 5e came around, okay, uh, have helped immensely with the popularity of D&D itself. And they've really opened up a lot of avenues to go do things, podcasts, Twitch casts, yep. uh, and also the technology has come around a lot at the same time as well. But they they really have opened up those those avenues, and not only that, but they have brought in a, a culture where it's okay to play the games. You're not considered. You're, I mean, you still may be considered a geek. But it's okay, especially when you come and you see, you know, the, the Joe Manganiello's and the Vin yep. Diesel's and, and, you know, uh, shoot, what's his name? The, the uh, Sam Tarwell from, from Game of Thrones uh-huh. have all been on, at one time or another, have all been in, on and done things with, with uh, Critical Role. Yeah. So huh. it, it's shown that, you know, a lot of this is okay, especially... Man, Janelle is nuts. I mean, uh-huh. I don't know if oh, his whole basement room. <laughs> Everything. This guy, I mean, he just, you know, he absolutely embraces it. And in they did, it was him. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting help again. <laughs> uh, so it was he, the big show. Yep. The Grog from Critical Role. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I can't think of his name right at the moment. At the moment. And, uh, but they... They all did a thing. It was, it, and it was hysterical. I mean, it, you know, and it was, it was the big show's first, t- you know, experience with D and D. They put it on there, and it was awesome. And it, I mean, for for those guys to do that and put it out there, I mean, they, and they laughingly call themselves Jocks Machina, right? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it was, you know, so, but it was, it was awesome because there are a lot of other guys out there that, you know, I mean, they absolutely have played these kind of games for years and years and just never said anything because they kind of did it, you know, they were kind of, you know, closet gamers, so yep. to speak. Because it Things just, you it talked wasn't... about in the club, you know, you, d- you didn't talk about it or reveal it until you really knew somebody. And in, in, in a lot of ways, too, it seems like a secret weapon for a lot of these actors. It's easier for them to get into character or into a character mindset when you have, in some ways, some experience. Yeah, where... and I mean, that, I mean, I, I did a lot of acting when I was younger. Okay. Um, so, uh, right up until about the time that I left California, actually. Uh, and it helps. I mean, the whole, I mean, just having that imagination and having that that idea of putting a character together real quick. And improv- you know. improvisation. And actually, there's a question I was about to touch on that, too, was we played at the Alliance Traverse City last week. And we had a couple of new players, and two of them were drama kids. Mm-hmm. They were like, oh, we'll be fine, drama kids. And it was interesting talking with them, too, because they admitted it right out. They are like, yeah, I could, I could act and play as a character, but the improv skills made them nervous. 
So obviously that that mix between the two, like you, what do you decide you like? You, uh, how do you what do the improv skills? Is that something you feed more on or? Yeah, I mean it's because I mean one of the one of the big one of the big skills for for acting is always trying to put together a biography of the character. Mm-hmm. Now I mean you may have the character right there in front of you, but. And it's something that a lot of people struggle with is, is trying to put together a backstory or a biography of the character so that you have an idea of what their motivations are. And, right. you know, what's my motivation? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, in, you know, it's the it's the big questions. Is, you know, what do you want? When do you want it? And right. What are you willing to do to get it? Get it. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and those are always tough questions to to answer. And those always come about when you're playing D and D. I mean, it, or role playing of any type. Uh, so it's it's an invaluable invaluable. <laughs> I now have a four year old climbing over my shoulder. Um, I wish you guys had a camera and could see this. But it's uh, he's practicing I mean, it's, his uh, shadow Colossus skills. There you go. Apparently, but he you know I mean it's an invaluable. It's an invaluable tool for an actor because it, it teaches them to quickly come up with these things and and be able to go, you know, as soon as they get a script, in auditions and those types of things, put it together and get an idea of, okay, that's what this, this is what's going on with this character in the background. This is what's, you know, so it, it helps them out a lot. I mean, it really does help out a lot. And, and I think that's why you see, you know, I mean, that's why you see the, 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 <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> I, I am going to go uh, relieve myself of this. Hold on. Mommy to the rescue. There we go. Mommy's bribing him with ice cream. There you go. Hi, cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that's why you see a lot of a lot of actors are leaning towards it or have and not said anything and are now lighting up to do it. I mean, Deb Ram Wall is another one. Charlie Cox. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matthew Lillard, yeah, uh, yeah, was another one on on Deborah Ann Wool's game that she's run, which I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's fantastic. Okay, we'll I will it definitely I have seen to it. check it out. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's very interesting the way she does it. Is she's got the it's the way she can bring in guest stars every week. Is it's a she, you know the 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 DM character is a, a uh, like an antiquities dealer. Okay, and. It's always, you know, about her going, you know, about her sending people out to go investigate antiquities. And it's three characters, three or four characters that are there, regulars. And then every week she has a guest star come in. So the first week was Matthew Lillard. Uh, I don't remember who it was the second week. Then Charlie Cox came on. Okay. Uh, and it's been great. It's been a lot of fun to watch. And she also does it interesting because she has the set. Where it's got all these knickknacks all over the place, uh-huh. and it's you know as the game's going on, she, you know right as they get going, she's okay. Well, you can go grab something from the you know grab something from the store here and take it with you, and it's got a tag on it that has. Oh, that's you know, the, really the cool. Effect. Oh, it's, it's it's really well done. But it, again, it's just showing that this is you know, and Charlie Cox had never played before. Went in to play it, and they had an out interview, and he was just like, "That was a lot of fun, right? <laughs> like right up there, you know, right up their alley and everything." So, pretty cool stuff for actors. So and, I have. And, yeah, go uh, ahead. Well, I, well, Chris just pointed a question, but actually, one <laughs> that I wanted to ask you is: so you PC and DM. Little, mm-hmm. you how about a little uh, take on both? Because I know I know you more. As a dungeon master, I've seen you do the plot side at LARPing, and I've played in a few of your campaigns as a DM. I've only had the fortune of actually playing with you as a fellow player a few times at a LARP, but yeah, I primarily know you as a DM. Do you prefer A or B, and maybe some benefits of which which you like? Uh, I I really like, I guess I like running, run, running plot or doing plot, so... Uh, I like the DM side of it, and and really because I like sharing the story. Okay. And and by that I don't mean telling my story, because that's simply not what's going on. And and that's one thing. It, I always am leery if I hear a, a, a DM that I'm going to be playing with that says, "Yeah, I've got a great story that I want to tell." Well, no, because I'm not there to listen to your story. I am okay. there to participate 
in a story. Okay. Be a piece, the, not the not the the train on the railroad, so to speak. Right, and it's it's the way you look at it. It's collaborative storytelling, and so I love setting up, and, and I always referred to it when I was on plot. And I, Dusty, you probably heard me talk about it this way, or in is that I always referred to what I put together as my skeleton. Yep. And then the players and whoever is in the in the game fills out the rest. Mm-hmm. They put the you know the sinew and the muscle and everything else onto it because if if I just went in and said here's my story, the NPCs are doing this and you know it becomes very inactive as far as a player goes and not interactive, which is what you want from a LARP or an RP. So do you have a moment off the top of your head and putting you on a spot a little bit sure. that a player did something to your skeleton and you looked and went, yup, that's going right in. Like that is now the oh. brains are a major organ. Not just like, I, okay, this is going to be some muscle, this is a tissue, this helps flesh it out. This is. I, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I've absolutely had that happen. Um, I've had that happen a lot with uh, Loaded Dice Adventures so far. Awesome. Uh, and I had one just the other day. Uh might have been one that you actually watched, Gabe. Uh, okay. But it was, I had, had a thing going on, and it's, it's part of the backstory. And I always try and draw it, put parts of my backstory into the the game itself. for So to give the players something to care about. And sure. then I also try to pick up pieces. I, I leave them agency to, to to put things into the world. So this guy came and he was like, okay, my background, he's a pirate. And he fell in love with somebody, and he wants to prove himself. I'm like, okay, right. what else? And he's like, well, that's really kind of all I've come up with. I'm like, okay, so it's cool if I run with that. <laughs> you know, in the back of my mind, I'm salivating because <laughs> you're, right, you're leaving you know, that open an awful that lot to run with. <laughs> uh, he's like, yeah, you know, no problem. Okay. So I came back, said, you know, that... The guy, the the girl that he loved, was the daughter of a rich merchant who hated his guts, okay. and and basically was you know wanted nothing to do with him, and so he was trying to raise he's been trying to raise money to get his own ship to go prove you know that he can become a merchant you know and, and prove to the father that he's just as good as that guy is. I'm like okay, great, and so then they went and. The way we started, we started in Strahd. We started in, in uh, Curse of Strahd, and they were gone for quite a long time. So I, when I had them come back, he was like, I'm going to go look for Raquel. I'm like, all right. Okay. So, went, so he goes to go look for her. She's not there. He's like, what's going on? And he finds out that, you know, so he's like, okay, I got to get my ship. I got to prove to her that I'm, you know, that I'm. I'm the man's man, so to speak. Yeah, that everything's good, you know, and I'm worthy of this. I got to prove to her father that. So, he, all of the money that he got from Curse of Strahd, he sent to a shipyard, okay. all of it, and said, I, "This is a down payment for the ship that I want to build." Devoted to the back history. Oh yeah, nice. So, he sends a he's and they're they're way up north from where the where the uh, the shipyards are, okay. and he sends a missive to him. And they send it back and say, hey, your ship's ready. And he's like, what? Wait a minute. What do you mean my ship's ready? I sent you a down payment. I, you know, that's the cost is 10 times as much as what I sent you. It's like, yes, it's been paid for. Your ship's ready. And he was like, oh, great. So he goes down there. That's, and, that's red flag number one. Like oh, yeah. immediately. That's, maybe that's just the paranoia kicking in. That's like, uh... so, so he shows up and he sees his ship and he's like, this is awesome. This is great. And then he sees this middle-aged, heavy-set guy that's sitting there waiting for him with a scowl on his face, and finds out that when he disappeared, Raquel took it upon herself to go look for him, mm-hmm. and somehow is out there on the seas somewhere looking for him. And he basically said, "So I'm purchasing the ship. It's my ship. You will take it, and you will go find her." Okay. All right. So that that's where they've gone so far. So the you know, the one that he threw me a real curveball on is during the Curse of Strahd, uh, there are 
And if anybody's planning on running it or playing in it, there's it's a spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler okay. warning. Uh, spoiler. <laughs> um, so there are these amber sarcophagi in uh, in one of the the places you go to that hold the vestiges of these old ancient evil gods, and they will give the, if a player makes a deal with them, they'll give the player some kind of ability. Okay. And Gregamel, the rogue that I'm talking about, yep. made a deal with, with one that would allow him three times he could scry, uh, and then the power would go away, and when it happened, he could not talk over a whisper. <laughs> so, And that went on for a long time. So he'd only ever use the power one time, you know, just never, never use it again. And then they had hunted, they were hunting down a dragon, and he was like, hey, you know, if you guys, if you guys front the money for the, you know, the the, the holy water, etc., you know, I'll go ahead and I'll scry, and I'll tell you what happens. And the party was like, yeah, okay, you know, not a problem. So he went to go scry, and was up in his room by himself. Nobody else bothered to go with him, which I don't know why. Right. <laughs> uh, Never split the party. <laughs> you know, well, that and he's pretty shifty anyway. Fair. And so he's like, okay, you know, I get everything down. I start the ritual. Pat, I'm going to scry Raquel. Okay. okay. I was like, and no lead up to it. No hint that that's what he was going to do. And I was oh, just like, through your uh, curveball. Uh, okay. So I was like, okay. So basically I just had the, the ancient – evil, which was essentially a rider with him the whole time, popped up again and said, you know, I would, you know, you've got, you have my gift and I need, you know, I need to make a foothold in this world. I need followers. I need my high cleric. If you find my high cleric, I will grant you, you know, I'll grant you an extension on the scrying ability. And I'm wow, thinking, okay. and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, no way on earth is this guy <laughs> going to accept a, a deal with the devil, right? And he's like, okay, fine. And I was just like, uh, okay. Like, <laughs> deal. Whoa. So, I mean, you fa- you triggered a major motivation for that player. That's what yeah. it sounds like. Yeah. And then I had, I had another one too, um. A lot of my players, for whatever, chose seaborne backgrounds. Sure. We had, we had two, we had one sailor, one pirate, one privateer. Okay. Uh, out Walk of into the six a bar. players I had, <laughs> had, right? Out of the six players that I had, and so they, you know, the the one player, and then we had, a, had another player who was a druid who is a half elf who's you know was sold into slavery. Blah blah blah. You know, and and that's essentially you know the way that was all going, and during Strahd, I I threw made something, I threw it in there, and it was this guy who was a slaver, who was one of the Vistani, who are the only people that can come and go from Barovia, free you know with you know no, you know with no uh, special abilities like they just have the ability to come and go as they want. Yeah, like the Miss Walker, Miss Walkers, or whatever, right? right. Yeah. Right. And so they show up and it's so we've got the druid who is sold into slavery. We had the skyship crewmate who that was another thing, too. I, I had no intention of having skyships in it. She wrote her background with a skyship. And I was like, OK, I guess there's skyships now. Okay. OK. So and then uh, and then the third, the privateer had her boat sunk by a pirate and then she was left to hang and the party found her as she was hanging on the tree so they show up here's the you know here's the the slaver with the wagon slaves in the wagon and the the dragonborn barbarian who's the privateer who was left to hang sees him first and i say okay you know you recognize this guy as the pilot of the sky ship that came down and sank your ship. Hmm. And just like, oh, you know, she's going to kill him. 
our halfling monk, who is the crew member of the sky ship that mutinied, recognizes him as the guy that started the mutiny. Okay. <laughs> and then the druid crap. finally sees him <laughs> and recognizes him as his father that sold their whole tribe into slavery. <laughs> Wow. <clears throat> so you tied everything together for each other. Yeah, so they hate this guy. And he he winds up getting away. Oh. Just because he's like, you know, they, they came after the whole group of him and he was just like, uh, I'm out of here. Deuces. And, and bailed. <laughs> and then he shows up in Avenaria as an agent of the crown. And, you know, they can't touch him legally. Like, they all want to kill him. Sure. And so, you know, he, he shows up there, and now it's, you know, he put a, a – essentially, he, he impounded Gregamel's ship on the docks. Okay. Has essentially, you know, they came in and assaulted him inside of an inn. So he was like, okay, you know, normally we'd just arrest you for this, but uh, I'll tell you what. You know, you do some work for me, and we'll excuse those charges. So, yeah, it, it's – that that character right they now helped I think he, you write so much oh, just well, not even knowing. And all this is on your um, loaded dice adventures. Yes, that's okay, all. Awesome. I do remember catching a couple of these and like listening in and going, awesome, "Okay, the characters actually. are really cool." And actually, <laughs> right. so one thing that we noticed with the, um, especially with the loaded dice adventure, which actually transitions perfectly, is like you you have your show and like your setting and everything else. You have a lot of different players that seem to roll in here and there, but you also have a lot of like equipment all set up and stuff, right? Yes. Between the table that you guys have and what you have presented on Twitch with your character pictures, the, the sliding bar on the side that has all their hit points and everything else, okay. their character names. Yep. Like, it's a pretty decked out setup. So if money wasn't an issue in this, what other things would you want to help that tabletop experience, be it for uh, loaded dice or for anything else? I, we could use better cameras for sure. Yeah, uh, we're we're running on some some pretty low end. I mean, I shouldn't say low end. We're we're running on some pretty middle of the road cameras. Sure. Uh, we've got one good camera that we use, and so I, that would be. I uh, love to have a a box that's dedicated to just this. Mm -hmm. uh, oh sure. Have. And then I can't remember what Eska calls it, but there's a. a they have these boxes set up that you can set up the macros on. So, because right um, now... Yeah, I can't think of it. I know what you're talking about, though. Yeah, it, and right now, because Eska, who you may see every once in a while, he basically... it's We're at his house. Right. Okay. And he will see, he has his room set up, which is like his streaming room, because he runs Dangerous Caramel on Twitch. Um, and he runs from there. And when we come and play, he just... He basically stays in there. He's the one that does all the the camera switches and everything else. Okay. Uh, and, and he can macro all that stuff and put it on a box. Cause he set off and he's like, I, I, I'd love to come join you guys and go play, but you know, I'm, I'm here. I can't really do it. I'm running everything. So, right. right. I'm producing yeah, so, it. Right. So that maybe some mics that, uh, you know, some new mics. We're on that. And, we're on the same page as you there. We're like always looking to upgrade mics. Oh, and yeah. I mean, that's even the uh, yeah, accessories constant. with the mics, boom stands and pop filters yeah, exactly. and all that bullshit. I mean, I, I mean, I'd love to have lapel mics for everybody. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? That's a good call. Which, I mean, in the whole scheme of things, they're not that expensive. Hmm. But when you're talking about seven of them. Right. It adds up quickly. Yeah, it adds up pretty quick. So that... Uh, I'd love to be able to just go buy out everything in, in Ark and Forge. <laughs> right. Yeah. As far as like, <laughs> maps and music and everything else. So, yeah, I mean, that's – there's a, just a lot of stuff. That, you can always you know, find something more to add to it. It's oh, like absolutely. shopping. Absolutely. So it but, seems like that you do a lot of fantasy gaming. Yes. Have you Most done fantasy. any of the other stuff with, like, Shadowrun or post-apocalypse stuff with, like... Um, Savage Lands. Savage Lands, Dead Deadlands. Lands. Any other games that... You, or you just really dug your heels into D&D, &D, especially 5th edition. But, like, uh, really dug your heels into D&D &D and said, this is my bread and butter. I mean, D&D, &D, Pathfinder are going to be my... You know, those are going to be my bread and butter. But I've, I've run... Uh, we've got a great bar out here in Milwaukee that uh, used to be 42 Lounge, and they have moved. Now they are Oak and Shield. 
Okay, mm-hmm. we had an oaken shield for a while, but it didn't last. Uh, not the same, I don't think. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, and I've, I've seen you guys advertise for and talk about it on your uh, Twitch stream about Oaken Shields. Yeah. They do a thing they, for Renaissance Fair, in fact. Oh, okay. Yep. First originated, we actually were going to run the show from 42 Lounge. It just was way too loud, and the owner of 42 Lounge actually played a character for a while, and she essentially, when we started playing, we ran a couple shows at Esca's, she essentially said, no, you know, I, I want to run them here because if I'm there, all I'm going to get is, hey, you know, what about this? What about this? What about this? You know, I will never get to play. So it's like, okay, you know, so we did that. But we've always kept that tie to them. So we make announcements every day that we that we show. And uh, we just have announcements for Oak and Shield. Okay. Uh, one, of the guy, one of the guys who plays with us, Tim, is the mm-hmm. is an IT guy for the, the zoo here. So we get the, the zoo updates from him. Uh, we've got Hannah, who is part of a theater group, so she gives her, you know, her theater stuff. And then uh, Greg Amell, uh has he actually mills pens and other stuff. Well, Dusty, you should have a uh, bottle opener in your hands pretty soon here. Nice, yay! <laughs> uh, I won that one, the uh, the emerald green one. That's awesome. Yep, yep. Which so is fitting because right at that time. Uh, Dusty here and I both actually just joined up with the Order of Emerald Flame, if you remember that name. I can't believe they're still around. <laughs> they actually, what, five of them, four of them, now actually own Alliance South Michigan. Nice. And okay. they, they use their experience, which is kind of also one of the premises of the show, of using your experience as a, air quote, gray muzzle, as an older gamer, to better the game that you play or you love. And I'm sure there's some experiences you have where growing up you look and you ran a, a way you ran a, a UDM a game or played a game. Looking back now, I went like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> or more importantly, like not only did I did that, but maybe this was fun for player A, B, but then C, D, E, F, and G all hated it. And is it worth yeah. that trade off? Uh, we've, we've seen plenty of that, I know. So based on that, what are kind of transitioning from some of the younger players that you might have had over the years? What are some of the worst things you've seen done when it comes to versions of rules changes per table topping? I know big people weren't a fan of that transition from 3.5 to 5. Or even 3.5 to 4. And then 4 tanked and then came back with fifth well i think a lot of that was because for whether they whether they say that or not four was a blatant grab to try and grab the mmo crowd absolutely 100 percent. and and they they realized i think going to 5e that their audience is not while it might be that audience they don't want the MMO at their tabletop. If they want to play an MMO, they're going to find an MMO to play it. They want exactly. a tabletop that's actually going to be challenging. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, some of the worst. Wow. Um, I, I had a couple of players in a game that I ran wow, years ago that used the in-character shield for some pretty bad behavior. They, and it it irked me, and I kept it under wraps until some of my players came and said the same thing. But it was essentially, you know, we'd put story elements into it, and the story elements would come out, and they would, in character, grouse about it. Like, I had a okay. library. They, they, they came into the, into the game late, and were like, you know, how can we find out what's been going on? What, what's the history? Where's all this stuff? And I, so I said, okay, you know, they're going to, we'll start you out at this monastery. I'll have a library at the monastery. And you guys can read the history. That way you'll kind of have an idea of what's going on. It explains why you have local history. It explains, you know, those types of things. Kind of get you caught up. Right. So the first couple of games, they start talking about, well, I can't believe it. They have this library here. Why they're And it's just like, so I kind of, you know, it was like, okay. I just kind of swallowed it and was like, all right. Because you kind of got a point because it's kind of silly. But it was essentially there just for you. Okay. So you caught up. It was just a... Do say you know it's a ex machina thing, big time. Okay, sure. And then you know, and then they went on, and we had another. You know, they went to go visit the dwarves, 
and the doors were set up in the in a in a way, and they you know immediately just started bashing. Well, I can't believe it's set up like this. That's just as their character. It just doesn't make any sense. That they would you do this? Why wouldn't you do this? And it's just like, and there was it, it wound up being a, a a character that was playing a dwarf that actually outside of that came to me and just said, my character would have absolutely no reason to travel with these people. Everything that they have said in character, everything they have done, she would just hate them. Okay. With a <clears throat> with a passion, you know, and it was so I you know I I mentioned it to the the two players. I was like, look, guys, this is what's going on. I've noticed it. You're critical about everything that happens. They're just playing contrarian to be contrarian at that point. Right. Yeah. And I brought it up to them. They're like, oh, well, that's just the way these characters are. And I'm like, that's fine. But (laughs) that's the way the characters are. The people that you're playing with, their characters have no reason to have your characters stay there. Right. And. Then they, they just refused. They're like, well, we're, we're not going to change our characters. And eventually I was just like, all right, well. Then. So then you're cr- encroaching on to, like, player versus player. And right. at the end of the day, you've got to get along as a group to kind of yep. forward the well, story. That even goes beyond just tabletopping, too. Again, we're we're all LARPers here. And, and we see yeah. that a lot as well. Where and it, you use the abuse it, of, oh, my character would say that. When you're like, yeah. no, 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 no you're Steve, you're, a, an you're an asshole. You're an asshole. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what it came down to is whether it was their character or not, the people playing the other characters around them just got to, you know, were like, I don't care if that's their character or not. I'm slitting your throat while you sleep. Deal with yeah. it. Yeah, and it just just was not good. There's other things, too. I mean, it becomes very hard, especially in, in, in the LARP environment, to make sure that... And this was something that happened in where they had a they had a legit core group of players that were there that put themselves out and did stuff. But the problem was is that the plot team at the time wrote the plot and f- essentially funneled it all to them. And these characters were in charge of like handing it out to the other people. Mm-hmm. Well, I know exactly what you're talking about. Too. I know you. It I know you never do. Never happened that way. I, I know you do, Gabe. I know exactly. <laughs> and actually, a good number of our listeners know exactly who you're talking well, about. And too, that's so fine. It's even but, funnier. But I had a huge problem with that. And oh, sure. As a as a thing, I wrote to the plot team in confidence. Essentially, said, "Hey, look, you know, this is something that you're doing. You're catering to these people, and you're going to wind up losing other people because they don't feel like they're getting anything to do." Or that what they're doing is being throttled, and that any of the good stories, the good ideas, are going to go to are going to go to those people, and they're not getting any of it. There, there'd basically be a fun filter. We'll take yeah. anything good and fun that we see interesting, and you guys can go and deal with well, these problems. The plot team took that email and brought it to the people I was talking about. All right. Yeah, and then what do you do? <laughs> yeah, at that, that point. point, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> lambasted. <laughs> Well, I mean, he they came to me. Yeah, you're damn right we do this because, you know, we, we've been here longer. We've done this. And I said, I understand that, guys. And you guys have reaped the benefits. You've got all of your gear. You've got titles. You've got all this stuff that you have plotted for. But at the same time, how long do you think the chapter is going to last if all of the new people that show up leave? And that's because kind that's of what's happening. what's sort of been happening in just the last I would say 10 or 15 years for me personally since I'm a little younger to it than Dusty and you are is there's a big sway away from that that they're they're fighting against those teams being the only people that get the plot and get the major stories so they, I think they've learned, or in general, plot has learned over the years that that's not the way to run it. Well, that's good. That is good. And and I mean, and that's, you know, Seth may have gone rogue, and he may have done some weird things and all. You mean Seth, owner of Neural Kalamazoo? Oh, yeah, but I will say this much. That guy, his plot was out there for anybody. That's true. Anybody, you know, anybody who wanted to interact with it. And there were things that went on that just simply did not get not advertised. No, yeah. sure. I mean, there, there was stuff. Like, he, w- he would literally send guys out into the wilderness and just have them start doing rituals. Yep. 
Okay. And if it. you stumbled on it, that's great. If you didn't, you didn't know any better. Yeah, until things started happening in town, you know, and the whole <laughs> town panic gas all of a sudden around. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like, you know, why are we getting attacked by so many undead? And, you know, Seth came out and basically said, this stuff's been going on forever. You right. know, you guys just aren't patrolling. You're not taking care of the town. I was like, oh, ouch. Okay. <laughs> right. So speaking of undead, tell us a little bit about your favorite table topping tropes. Oh, boy. I, I I try and turn tropes on their head a lot. Okay. But wow, my favorite. And even I, I and mean, if want to piggyback with that too, like how useful can some of these tropes be to you as a DM? Tropes are always useful because if you need to, if you need to get information into your players' hands, mm-hmm. using a trope is a really good way because they'll spot it, they'll know what to expect, and they'll you know move on accordingly. So. In, in that regard, I mean, you know, they came into town, my town, and one of my, you know, one of my tropes has always been the, the tinkerer. Yes. You know, okay. The, the hand, or the bartender that knows a whole lot, those types of things. And those are always handy because they know my play, you know, the players know, hey, if I go into town, I go to the bartender. All right. Steve gonna, will know something. Yeah. Steve's going to know something. Right. <laughs> or, you know, the very well connected thieves guild. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course. Here's another one. I just make sure that those things always come with strings attached. Sure. So, yes, you may get some great information, but there's going to be an expectation along the lines of, you know what, you've got this great information, but they want something. Oh, of course. What are you doing Tip for, for me? That. <laughs> yeah. And especially from a thieves' guild. They're going to be especially that way. Of, oh, you know, well... We'll we'll call the marker in at some point. And it's always a key so that if they get stuck, they know they can always pull in right. those favors, but it's going to cost them. So it, they've got to be really stuck to be able to pull on that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, but then, you know, I mean, some of the other things I like to do, like I say, turn them on their head is you've got the bartender that knows a lot, but she's also giving out information a lot. Right. So oh. everybody knows this information. <laughs> Well, not only that, but because of the who the character is, and she's so very friendly and such a nice person, and the players get to know her, and she gets to know them. So if somebody else comes along and says, hey, what do you know about these guys? Who's the bigger bidder at that point? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you may think, you know, she's nice and everything, but it's not to say she's not in it for the money either. Right, she's selling your secrets. I like that kind of stuff because then it becomes a thing of it becomes a thing of it makes your players think out, actually you out, yeah you, know, you got to figure out who you can trust you know okay so I know the thieves guild when when they give us information they want something but generally you know I can understand what they want it makes sense and it's not it's not that bad this person I'm going to talk to man what they're talking about is kind of shady you know what what's going right. on or i know if i if i go do something and get information from them they're going to give that information to somebody else you know those types of things it's, you know so now it's you've, you've got to get to know people it's been a lot of fun it, and that's you know it goes back to player agency too where those characters that i have a lot of them have been created by the pcs okay sure uh, gabe you haven't been introduced to yvonne yet the, the tinkerer <laughs> in my in my okay. town uh, because they haven't gone to visit her in a while, and, and now that they're actually in the, the capital city, it may be a while before they find her again. Sure. But she came about because one of my players, who's a ranger, was like, hey, I want to go you know, see if somebody can make, you know, th- and it was essentially a, a, a plague mask with special lenses in it and some kind of filter so they could filter out gas. I was like, all right. You know. It's like, so I'm going to go find the tinkerer in town. I was like, all right, I really hadn't planned to find a tinker. <laughs> sure, great. There's a tinker, and I said, okay. So you know, you go and you find the sign that looks like you something you expect from a tinker, and you go inside. You know, what is what do you what do you think you're seeing in there? What do you and, you know? He's oh well, you know, I, I know that they're going to have a bunch of stuff work they're working on. Okay, so I ran with it, and Yvonne just became this. She talks a million miles a minute, <laughs> switches from one topic to another at like the drop of a hat. And does not let the PCs get a word in edgewise. I feel targeted. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. This is way worse. Nice. I mean, it, 
and it, it's gotten to the point of, I mean, like, it, it's really funny because the guy that plays Gregamel, somebody will mention, oh, you know, I, I think we need to go talk to Yvonne about this. And he's like, he's like, oh, my God, he's like, I, I need a drink. I can't deal with this. Right. And, uh, you know, and so everybody is just like, anytime anybody was talked to Yvonne, everybody's just like, oh, my God, like, what's going to happen now? <laughs> And it's been it's been fun. I mean, it, it's it's a fun character. It came about because the the player essentially invented them or wanted them invented, right. and I just ran, I just ran with it. But she's been a blast, and it's really funny because the the newest player Hannah, who created her character, came in, and the the other players were she, she well she needs to go talk to Yvonne, doesn't she? And everybody's like laughing down the sleeve kind of right. thing. So she goes to talk to Yvonne says something and Vaughn starts off on a rant and she's like, oh, so this is what's going on? Well, yes. I'm gonna... And she's like, okay, thanks. Bye. And it was just like, I mean, just cut Yvonne off at the legs. I mean, just whap. Wow. Okay. And the whole, the all the all the players were just like, like what? oh my god. Like, she <laughs> got out without having, you know, she got out of there without having Vaughn go off. What what happened? Like, Wow, they were just stunned. I mean, it's just they fun. thought they were hazing her. <laughs> yeah, and it's I mean, one of the, the funnest moments in that game came when they had uh, Victor and Greg Amell and I want to say Sonara. All three of them went in to go talk to Yvonne, and I had that kind of speed, that kind of response <laughs> oh, to three players at the same time. Changing and responding to each one of them. And it was funny because Gil, who plays the druid, at the end of it was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, how did you keep all of that straight? Because you were going a mile a minute. They'd interject something. As you were talking to somebody else, you'd answer them, come back to the other person, then go to the other person. He's like, that, like, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck just <clears throat> happened? Yeah, I mean, they were all just like, whoa. <laughs> that leads into a perfect segue then because... Our time is getting a little narrowed here, so we're going to do okay. a rapid fire. Okay. All right. And a couple of random uh, rapid fire questions that we can kind of, you know, elaborate on a bit, but we'll keep it short and sweet, so to speak. Sure. So do you have a ra- favorite race and class? Half elf bard. Half elf. I, I'm, I'm partial to bards. Oh, so what can I say? Brown nosing the host here. I, I love bards. <laughs> nah, nah. I mean, if you know, I mean, Gabe and I, we, we RP'd together when we Kalarith, and I don't remember the name, uh, Kalarith, and I don't remember the name of your character from Rift. Um, oh, Arpeggio. Arpeggio. I played a bard named Arpeggio. That is some yeah. meta shit right there. <laughs> yeah. We used to have a great time with them, and both I mean, both those characters were more or less bards. Just a blast. So, I mean, I've been playing bards for a long time. Okay. I've come to the conclusion that bards are just old rogues. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. Retired you start off, rogues. you start off as a rogue. You think you're gonna be edgy and cool, and then like you hit a point where you've seen some shit, and then you become a bard. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That works. Um, I have a couple of random questions from some actually some listeners as well. Uh, okay. So this is kind of funny because they they run their own D and D thing. What's the largest amount of damage that you've seen done by a PC or by like or uh, an NPC? NPCs get a little easy, I guess, because you can have a beholder yeah. just be like, and disintegration ray, peace. <laughs> yeah, I, I can do 5e pretty easily. Uh, the most amount of damage done was done by our paladin Victor. Uh oh. Against Strahd. Uh oh. Um, and it oh, was, this was the zero to hero moment, wasn't it? Yes, this was. Oh, it was. Tell an this epic one moment. because this is actually it, a really good moment. Yeah, on... this this was an epic moment for him. Now we in in loaded dice we have. Uh, a system where people that are listening earn gold, and then you can gamble and you can earn more gold, okay. and then you can use that gold to purchase. At this point, it's only purchasing advantage or inspiration. Inspiration. Okay. Yep. So you can purchase inspiration for the characters. And going into the fight, these guys were they were getting hammered pretty good. I mean, they were they were in a lot of trouble. And so somebody purchased inspiration for Victor, who is a paladin cleric. Okay. And so he goes, and he sets up to go hit Strahd. He's got he, it's a, it's a hit or miss kind of thing. If he misses, Strahd's gonna annihilate him. And if he goes down, Party pretty wipe. much the rest of everybody else has got a good chance of going down too. Okay. So he does. He takes his hit. He does a smite at one level, a burning smite at another level. Uses one of his other abilities, which you know adds more damage. 
adds more dice rolls because in 5e it's all of your dice rolled your rolled dice uh you roll twice right so and then at my table what we do uh is your when you roll twice your first set of rolls is maxed because Ooh. i hate the idea of having getting a crit and then you you make two shitty rolls and you do less damage than you would normally do with mm-hmm. a regular right, right. You, no, you, okay. that's a headshot but you did two points of damage Ooh. yeah to me it makes no sense right yeah. so so victor so Victor like dials up just this massive blow that he's gonna hit. He's got the sun sword, you know. He's just he's just firing up on this guy. He rolls a one, <sighs> and he's just like, "Oh my god!" He's like, "I can't believe! I can't believe! I can't believe!" And and he didn't have inspiration. And my rule on it for the for the viewers is that until I say what the result is, you can still buy him inspiration. So okay. I kind of I kind of. Long paused it. Yeah, I kind of paused and, you know. Was hoping. Okay. I'm thinking of you doing the, the uh, Jim Helpert from The Office and you could, like, look at the camera deadpan, like. Yeah, kind of. And then, <laughs> sure enough, somebody bought inspiration for, for Victor. And Victor, yeah, you know, the whole table goes. And Victor rolls. Yeah. Victor rolls it. Rolled a one the first time. Rolls a 20 <gasps> on the second roll. <laughs> yeah. Winds, winds up doing 99 points of damage. To Strahd in one in one blow, Ooh. which brought Strahd down, I think, to like five hit points or something, and then our our ranger finished him off, like right after the Kill next seal. Next. Yeah, it was, and, and it's so funny because that has happened to Victor <laughs> so often, and it's a running joke because our warlock has come in after Victor has done a massive amount of damage and killed things countless times oh no it's just so Gaier, who's the character tim who plays him always teases victor about it's like well you got to bring me in because i kill everything (laughs) and victor just i'm your inspiration (laughs) to be so great at least he didn't search his kills we have that issue (laughs) yeah no we don't, don't i don't have a problem with that so much so but yeah that was that's the most damage i've seen anybody do that's awesome and yeah, it was a great moment. And actually, that's a really good note to go out on. So a big high note, big damage deal, and Loaded Dice Adventures. So where can they find your stories and your tales for Loaded Dice Adventures? Loaded Dice Adventures is on Twitch. Uh, we have a broadcast every Monday or most every Monday. Uh, we've only missed a couple in three years, I think. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's Twitch TV, Loaded Dice Adventures, all one word. Uh, then we'd also have our Facebook page, which is Loaded Dice Adventures, all one word, and an Instagram, which I believe is the same. So Ooh. it's Loaded Dice Adventures pretty much everywhere. And it's uh, on Mondays at 7.30 p.m. Central Time. Yeah, 7.30 Central till, and you know, we just say till late, because sometimes we try to end right around 10.30, 11. Okay. Uh, we've been known to go a little over. Uh, <laughs> as, as promo <laughs> sessions do. Yeah, th- this upcoming Monday is probably going to run over uh one of our players gil who is our druid arvash is today graduating law school and passing the bar that's oh, right oh congrats so all night tomorrow uh, we are we are celebrating our rules lawyer <laughs> that's, literal uh, rules lawyer. that's fantastic and he's he's bringing in something to give away but we're gonna have we're going to do giveaways all night long. Uh, you know, we normally we give away some dice or a few other things, but we're going to have we'll have dice to give away, we'll have miniatures to give away. Uh, I paint miniatures, so we've given away custom painted miniatures nice. where the the person just tells me, you know, what kind of what kind of single mini they want painted and, and I'll do it up for them. So we'll probably give away one or two of those. I mean, we'll have a lot of stuff. And I know, unfortunately, I, I when this episode goes live, that'll be done in past. <laughs> However, we will be sure to uh, throw in our twi- uh, on our, uh, yeah. our our streams or our social media to come and listen. Yeah, and absolutely. See. Yeah, so that's. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna have a lot of fun with that. Awesome. Be good. Awesome. Well, so I super you- appreciate you uh, spending the Sunday evening with us. I know Game of Thrones is gonna show its last episode real soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and. It's been- uh, you know that uh, Watchmen is going to be the next show that they're banking yeah. on, right? Absolutely. Are you a comic book guy? I am. There okay. you go. So yeah. we'll have to have you on at another time then, for sure, to uh, go comics. Yeah, I will. Absolutely. I will come join you. 
because I know you and I talked a little bit off the side about what Marvel is doing with Phase Four, right? And you're all on board. um, Scroll Scroll, War, Scroll War. That's what Dusty Dusty White's talking about. All the Scroll Wars. Yep. And and White, here's one that'll back up that claim. The guy that played Talos, the Scroll Talos, uh huh, in Captain Marvel, the car the the actor, uh huh, when Spider Man. After you know everything is set right, okay. and Spider-Man goes back to his school and says hello to his buddy again and all that. There is a teacher in the background. Oh, are and you kidding me? The teacher is the actor that played Talos. Oh, that's oh! I have to go watch <laughs> that now. Oh, okay. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. Thanks again, Pat. We appreciate it, man. Thank you, guys. That was that was. This has been a lot of fun. If you guys ever want to go again. Let me know. I'm, I'm up for it. Awesome. Absolutely. All right, then. So, uh, and again, to our listeners, thank you very much for spending time with Dusty Red, Dusty White, and Pat. And until then, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Remember, we are all geeks. To be otherwise may very well mean to live without passion. Thank you for listening to another episode of Gray Muscle Geekery with Dusty Red and Dusty White. You can support our continued geekery at our Patreon website patreon.com slash graymuzzlegeekery. Be sure to check back often as we start to add geek cred levels. You can send your questions and comments to us at graymuzzlegeekery at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at graymuzzlegeek. We can be found on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Buzzsprout. And a special thank you to Pepper Coyote for our intro theme. And if you like what you heard, you can find more of his stuff on Spotify, Patreon, or directly from his Bandcamp page.